So we learned that the, there are two big differences between India and Israel. One is that in India, one million is a tiny fraction, and in Israel, it's the whole universe. And the second is that in Israel, all the mothers are Polish mothers, and they all trust their kids. So uh, with that, and uh, talking about identities and fraud, etc., uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Aviva Litan. She's a VP and a distinguished analyst at Gartner. Um, she works a lot about big data analytics, about uh, fraud, uh, identities, uh, PCI even. And she's also uh, started to dealing more and more with the pure cyber, which is the subject she's going to discuss today. Aviva is, also has a uh, long industry in our market with uh, 32 years in the IT security. And she's going to talk about all kinds of things, among them the context of war, security, and how she views us protecting ourselves. Aviva. Aviva. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm going to start by saying something politically incorrect. And uh, that's the best security companies come out of Israel. Uh, and it's really true. I follow companies. On, yeah, give yourself an applause. <laughs> Thanks. Put this down. Um, so we are going to talk about context-aware security, and it's very similar to what my colleagues were talking about in terms of layers. There's lots of different actors today that are attacking uh, all your companies. And they range in their motives and the attack examples, but the way to catch them is very similar. So if you look at the different types of attackers, we've got cyber criminals, we have insiders, hacktivists, cyber spies, and nation states. And they have different motivations, but the way to uh, stop them is very similar for cyber criminals, insiders, and of course the cyber spies. The nation states have different attack methods, and the hacktivists are just making noise and making trouble. But if you put in a solution to catch the cyber criminals, it works very well for insiders. Uh, and companies are starting to realize that. Oops, sorry. So I'm going to look at uh, two very well-known attacks and then come back at the end of the presentation and uh, see how context-aware security could have stopped them. So let's start with the target attack. You probably know a lot about it already, but I'll just review how it worked. Uh, the bad guys actually got in through a contractor, through the HVAC contractor. Somehow they made their way over the firewall, uh, some say that there was a vulnerability in the web browser of the contractor and they were able to get through that, get into the network of cardholder data. Uh, and then they got over into the cardholder data segment of Target and started experimenting and rolling out their malware to a few hundred uh, point of sale systems. Once they knew it was working and their attack was set up, then they rolled it out to thousands of point of sale systems. And so what they did is they planted the uh, malware on each of the point of sale systems in memory, very specific addresses. It woke up a couple seconds every minute because they wanted to be under the radar. They didn't want to consume too many resources. And it took the cards, it bundled it up, it encrypted it, it sent it to a compromised server at Target. So they got another server to send it to. Then they double encrypted it and they sent it out to an IP address that Target was always doing business with anyways. So it didn't get noticed on the way out because I think it went to the Marriott chains in Florida. So what did we see? What were the uh, vulnerabilities? There was weak authentication of the contractor. There was poor segmentation of the network. And there were too many alerts that you might have seen in the press that they had a couple of fire eye alerts go off. But there's lots of high priority alerts. Uh, you know, you can't really fault them for not seeing that alert because if you're getting 10,000 alerts an hour and they're not prioritized properly, it can really get lost in the shuffle. Now let's look at the uh, Snowden attack. What did he do? He was over in Hawaii. I think he had uh, had this contract to create a disaster recovery site in Hawaii. 
So it was not abnormal for him to be downloading files, but it was very abnormal to download, download them to a USB drive because disaster recovery is not done from USB drives. But in any event, he logged in from his uh, place in Hawaii at very odd hours, which was probably okay because he works weird hours. Although I will tell you there was a lot of traces on social media of his odd behavior for a couple of years before he did this crime. Um, I've got uh, like about 100 pages of what he did on social media. He was an egomaniac. He was talking about, you know, uh, conquering uh, different kinds of uh, online pharmacies and, and teaching people how to smuggle in pharmacies, how to smuggle in drugs how to stay anonymous on the internet, how to conduct weird sexual activities. I mean, the guy was really loony and he was not being followed at all in social media. A lot of this behavior would have showed up. He even complained about his management um, in social media. But in any event, he borrowed 20 to 25 passwords. I say borrow because many people say he actually stole them. Um, and he used those privileged passwords along with his super user privilege to go to the servers, the NSA servers in Maryland, and he basically used SSH to go from one server to the other. He deleted all the audit trails, and then he downloaded 1.7 million files to his USB drive. And some of those documents were limited to less than 20 staff, so uh, that was pretty unusual. So what do you do to solve all these problems? Well, there's so many different solutions out there and lots of companies are putting them in and you end up with death by point product. You just can't pay attention to all these different systems. It's very hard to integrate them. There's lots of alerts going off and who can keep up with them? And I, you know, I always feel bad when these CISOs get fired after a breach because I really don't think that the systems are adequate to inform them on what they need to, to learn in order to know what to react to. So we need more strategic technology and there's a lot of different components that aren't necessarily uh, in these buckets, but these are the three main buckets I see. First, protecting data at rest. Second, protecting data in transit. And third, context-aware security analytics. And so what do we mean by context-aware security analytics? We want this target state of basically continuous surveillance. So no matter where a user comes in from, no matter what device they come in from, we want to gather as much information we can about the transaction, the context of the transaction. We want to profile the user, profile the accounts, profile the devices and run that transaction against those profiles using different models. Of course, it's good to have self-learning models because you don't want to base it on what you know. You want it, what you don't know, you don't know, and we've heard about that at this conference. But the idea is this constant surveillance. And you also want to bring in external identity and threat intelligence. We've talked a lot about external threat intelligence, but we didn't mention identity intelligence. So if we were looking at Snowden's behavior on the internet, we would have gotten a lot of good intelligence to make him a suspect. Same with the guy that did the Navy shooting. I mean, he went crazy the last few years. We could have found that out by constantly getting this intelligence. I know there's a limit to what machines can do and improve. In the end, you can socially engineer almost anyone, but at least get your systems up to date, bringing in the external information, the profiling, baselining, and anomaly detection, and using the big data techniques to bring together all this structured and unstructured information and to turn it into actionable intelligence really quickly. And there are vendors that are out there, we just wrote a market guide on them, that are trying to do all this for you and bring this to the enterprise. So let's break it down a little bit. What does uh, this, what are the, the layers of context-aware security? You've heard a lot about different layers from the other speakers. This is the way I look at the layers. I put them into seven dimensions or layers. The first is around the endpoint. You want to do all you can around the endpoint. Look for mal malware, look at location, phone printing, device printing, etc. The second layer is the navigation and the network layer. Look for anomalies in network behavior and uh, protocols and execution of those protocols. 
The third layer is user profiling or account profiling for one channel or one product. The fourth layer is the same across channels. And then the fifth, it's moving to real time, but that's more of a batch process of big data analytics and looking for rings of activities. The sixth dimension is bringing in the external intelligence, and then the seventh is correlating everything in consolidated alert management. So the way it looks in your enterprise is basically like this. You, lot, you do whatever you can around the endpoint. If it's agentless, it's even better. You look at the navigation and the network, the profiling, layer three, four, five, the big data analytics, the external data, and then everything comes into a common page that the, uh, the, the SOC uses or whoever's managing the fraud uses. But everyone should be on the same page. The alerts should come together. They should be correlated and weighted. And this is much easier than said than done. But this is where the industry is moving. It's kind of like next generation SIM or next generation IAM. And it is starting to happen. So let's go back and look at the target breach and the Snowden breach and see how this may have solved or at least try to mitigate those problems. If we were deploying layer one around the endpoint and, and analyzing the traffic on the endpoints of the organization, we would have seen all of a sudden there's someone from Russia going in through an HVAC contractor endpoint. And now that doesn't really make sense. And why are they looking at the browser the way they're navigating? We would have seen abnormal contractor access. If we had layer two, we would have seen all these files from the point of sale system going to a compromised server at Target a server it never went to. These files from point of sale only went to processors. Now they're going to some other server. If we had profiling of the admin accounts on those point of sale registers, we would have seen them propagating the malware from machine to machine across the country. That would have been abnormal. If we were sharing intelligence, people had seen this black pause a year before the target breach. And they actually, in this case, they wanted to share it with U.S. CERT and weren't allowed to. I have a colleague that actually saw this in the wild, and they couldn't because of lawsuits. But theoretically, the threat, they, he was threatened with lawsuits if he shared the information. But theoretically, you should be able to share information on some malware. And if we had layer five, the big data analytics, we would have seen abnormal activity across the point of sale systems. Every, these point of sale systems are communicating with each other around, across stores, and they're also communicating with servers they never communicated with. And if we had correlated alert management, the people in the SOC would have seen the alerts they needed to see instead of 5,000 high priority alerts, and that's not really an exaggeration. How could this have helped the Snowden breach? Well, we may have seen abnormal contractor access. You know, he was logging in very frequently. I'm not exactly sure if that would have worked because the guy worked all the time from Hawaii. But it may have raised the score a bit. But we definitely would have seen if we were looking at the navigation, it's not normal for someone to be downloading 1.7 million files to a USB drive in Hawaii. That really doesn't make sense, and it's actually pretty surprising that no one actually saw that. If we were looking at the users and the accounts, we would have seen this admin account is going through the servers in Maryland uh, through SSH, and that was very abnormal. If we used big data analytics, we would have seen those 25 passwords that he borrowed were all accessing files uh, in unusual ways from this machine in Hawaii. Uh, and that was abnormal. And if we were correlating the alerts, we would have highlighted the alerts that we needed, especially the huge file transfers to USB drives. Now, granted, Snowden could have socially engineered the guy that's watching the alerts and said, I'm going to be doing some unusual activity and don't pay attention to these alerts. So social engineering is always a threat. But all these alarms would have gone off, and hopefully there's dual controls in situations like this. One thing I've learned about the intel agencies, at least in the US, and I hope there's no one here that I'm offending, is that they're really great at surveillance but it's very difficult to defend the information once they collect it because there's so many siloed organizations. And that's why they need to correlate and bring these alerts together because the silos are really preventing success. 
So in sum, what are the recommendations? You can't boil the ocean, so prioritize the assets, focus on your crown jewels, put context awareness into your security systems, profile, create those profiles. You know a lot about it in this country. You want to profile and look for anomalous activity. Of course, the bad guys know how to beat the profiles, but if you have lots of layers, you should be able to get the right alerts at the right time. And finally, we didn't talk about organizational alignment, but uh, that's critical. Technology is only one-third of the equation. The other two-thirds is policies and processes. And you can have the best technology. If you can't manage it, you're out of luck. So thank you for your attention, and I hope to get to talk to you later.